but we will consider uh, the effect of thickness on structure behavior of a uh, specimen. You can think about uh, specimen subjected to a certain type of testing. There's a crack here. It's under uniaxial loading or mode one loading. It could be subjected to a fracture test. But the specimen has a certain thickness. There's the specimen thickness. That's the crack front. It's on the uniaxial load. The crack length could be is to a and it's B. Normally, it's somewhere between the limiting cases of plain stress and strain. But what can you say about thickness if the problem is one of plain stress? For plain stress, what's the condition on thickness? What can I say? Zero, that's right. Now, in plain stress, there's the approach to zero, a thin specimen. And what about plain strain? Yes, there is. It is related to crack lines, even it's related to stress and tax factor and yield strength. It's described in fracture toughness standards. We will talk about it. But from theoretical point of view, this goes to infinity in case of thing. Uh, the behavior displaced by the specimen is different. A small specimen has a different fracture toughness a uh, thin specimen is a different fracture toughness compared to a thicker specimen. And yielding is also affected, as we have shown, which of these cases has the higher or larger plastic zone. Yes. Plain stress has a lot. Uh, we have evaluated larger plain stress uh, plastic zone. We have shown it. And approximate uh, stress distribution, plastic constraint factors, such parameters are also different. So we can start looking into the results for plain stress and strain. First, consider plain stress, for example. Well, the situation for plain stress, a generic crack tip under mode, mode one loading. There's the crack plane. These are the polar coordinates at the crack plane. And we know the approximate stress distributions. These are X and Y axis. And at theta equals zero, in this coordinate system, we know that sigma y, for example, this is k1 over square root of 2 pi x. And sigma x. Or uh, simply, sigma x is equal to sigma y. 
Furthermore, sigma x y is zero. Therefore, this is a principal stress plane. This plane is a principal stress plane. And sigma z z is zero. Which means that these are principal stresses. on this plane. They are equal and they are principal stress. Therefore, you can write sigma one equals sigma two, and that is equal to K one over square root of two pi x, sigma three is zero. And the definition of classic constraint factor, we have introduced n and m. What are n and m here? Yes, one and zero, which means that Plastic constraint factor is one, and it further implies that effective yield stress is SY for plane stress at theta equals zero. And this might help generate an approximate stress distribution. Again, suppose that this is sigma y at x comma zero structure. It's x and normally this is asymptotic stress distribution, but sigma y y equals sigma one, as we have shown. And when yielding occurs, this is equal to S y. Therefore, we will assume that stress in the plastic zone is S y. Yielding condition is satisfied at this point at RP and outside of the plastic zone, it's given by the asymptotic expression. Somewhat corrected due to the effect of plasticity, SY and RP, and they are related. And it's an asymptotic distribution for thin specimens or for plain stress. Plain stress can be used for thinner, relatively thinner specimens. So this could be an approximate distribution for thin specimens. And what is RP? We know that at the point of yielding, sigma yy, x comma zero is k1 over <clears throat> Or let me rewrite it. Sigma y at RP is K1 over square root of 2 pi RP. And this should be equal to what? That's why, right? And we are rederiving RP for plain stress, which is K1 squared over two pi SY squared. Then 
This is for thinner specimens or plain strains. And consider the case of plain strain. Try to draw an approximate distribution for plain strain. Again, we are talking about the same configuration. Crack local system. I don't feature what time strain. Again, sigma x x at x comma zero equals sigma y y x comma zero is same k1 over square root of 2 pi x this is a principal trans plane these are sigma one and sigma two they are equal to each other sigma xy at x comma zero is zero Again, we are looking into the result for theta equals zero. But sigma z is different now. There is a three axiality. This is called three axiality. It's a set in z direction. Sigma z z at x comma zero. It's two new. K1 over square root of 2 pi x. And this sigma 3 is taken as sigma 3. If you use for associated criteria, again, to find plastic constraint factor, 2 nu because it's sigma x plus sigma y. It's 2 nu. Again, I can uh, define n and m. What is n, for example? One. And m is two nu. And that's going to give you a plastic constraint factor for theta equals zero. It depends on nu, but you'll find it as t if you approximate a new as one over three. Which means that effective yield stress is larger sigma one is t s y at the point of yield. And this larger stress is required to plastically form the material. And this leads to a smaller plastic zone at the crack tip. And uh, you can generate an approximate distribution for thicker specimens. This crack tip this is a sigma y, x comma zero, which is sigma one. So this is X normally you have this asymptotic result. But if you account for effect, the effect of plasticity now yield effective yield stresses larger 3s1 as plastic zone is smaller and this is an approximate stress distribution that is rp and as we have shown before rp is one over 18 k 
one squared over 18 pi s y squared. Two uh, separate results for the effect of plane stress and strain. Now, how is fracture toughness of a specimen affected by these? Fracture toughness of specimen. And how is it affected by uh, thickness? In plane stress, as we have shown, plastic zone size is much larger and volume of material undergoing plasticity per unit thickness is larger than that calculated for plane strain. So a certain amount of work done by external forces is consumed by plasticity. And for this reason, it displays higher resistance to fracture. Higher resistance to fracture in plain strain, the situation is more critical. There is less amount of plasticity. Work done by external forces can be spent to fracture the material for crack propagation. Therefore, the fracture toughness in the case of plain strain is generally smaller. And actual tests can be carried out to understand this phenomenon. You can generate a fracture toughness specimen, measure the fracture toughness, and plot it with respect to thickness. That's an engineering way of showing this. And you know what KC is, I think. We are using KC in fracture criteria. And when you generate all these tests and if you show the variation of this tier, you will observe such a diagram The variation approximating this behavior and different zones are observed here. Three zones are identified. And this is named as plain stress, fully developed plain stress. Point. Transition from plain stress to strain as the thickness increases and this plain strain. And one of the things as I identified here is this constant value of Kc attained for larger thickness values. It's approaching a constant, which is independent of thickness. And this is assumed to be an actual material property. 
and this constant value is named as K1C. Now we are observing a lower fracture toughness value for plane strain compared to fully developed plane stress region. And the fracture toughness, the constant fracture toughness value for larger thickness is designated by K1C. This K1C is called plane strain fracture toughness. And this is the lower bound value for practical applications. And it is used in design calculations generally. Standard fracture, uh, fracture test, fracture toughness tests are carried out with higher specimens, uh, carried out for specimens with uh, larger thickness values. And this is generally used in fracture criteria, K1 goes K1C. Because of lower amount of plasticity for larger thickness specimens, the energy or work done by external forces are all to reserve to propagate the crack. And this primarily is the reason for lower fracture toughness value at uh, observed in the region compared to this fully developed plane stress region. And as you decrease the specimen thickness in this direction, you will observe an increase because the amount of plasticity is getting larger and larger. Uh, it leads to an increase in the fracture resistance the material, high amount of plasticity. And this is the peak point is the fully developed plain stress region. Now this region is also plain stress. This is also plain stress, but thickness is getting smaller and plastic volume is becoming smaller with the decrease in the thickness. The volume, total volume of the material is getting smaller and smaller, and this leads to a decrease in the size of the plastic volume as well. And that causes, again, a drop here uh, in this zone, in the fracture toughness. But here, in most applications, the thickness is not that small. This could be around one millimeter to two millimeters thin sheets. But in actual, actual applications, thickness is larger and fracture computations are most of the time carried out by considering the K1C value, plane strain fracture toughness value, because that is assumed to be the correct lower bound value for the actual fracture toughness of the material. And what, how can we compare fracture toughness values for different types of engineering materials? You can consider the data given in the book or in other sources, and I can give some examples. Uh, I can write down some uh, numerical values, for example, for carbon steel. Uh, K1C value and the unit megapascal square of meters. It's given as greater than 225 megapascal square of meters. That's relatively higher resistance to structure compared to other types of materials. And for alloy steel, 
the wide range is given an average range, for example, 45 to 175. Aluminum alloy or aluminum alloys. So average results. Now this is significantly smaller between 18 and 30 megapascal square root meters compared to carbon steel. Uh, uh, it's representative of they are, let me change this. It could be, let's increase it up to as an average value 40, maybe not that small. But these are, so there is a significant variation in say, say Stanford Chatham's values and in an engineering design, you should know you should have some amount of data on fracture toughness values, or you can carry out standardized tests. But there are certain materials which do not have significant resistance to fracture. Ceramics, certain types of ceramics, alumina, for example. Could be as low as three megapascals square to meter. Polyamide. It's processed by SLS. Selective laser sintering. Again, an average value. The metallic materials here yeah, have display significant toughness, but if you you can cut to categorize them, some of the metallic materials have can have lower fracture toughness value. So that's indicative of the resistance of the material to fracture whenever there are certain defects. And there are additional differences between the structure uh, between the yielding behavior of large thickness specimens and small thickness specimens. Uh, one of them is related to the slip plates. Again, we can uh, show it on a diagram, uh, or we can draw approximate the calculate in the directions for slip planes. Again, consider, we will consider these cases separately, a plane stress case. Plane stress mode one crack, for example. Suppose that this is the crack. It's our direction, it's theta. Consider principal stresses, at an element or at a point slightly above the symmetric plane, point P, for example, and draw the more circle, more circles for this point. Show the two dimensional stress distribution. Let's say that this is sigma one. And now sigma one is slightly larger than sigma two if the element is above the symmetric plane. And I can draw a more circle for this. Let's say that this is the point for sigma one. 
Sigma one. Another point sigma two. And the third principal stress is zero. And there's a star axis, there's sigma axis. So I, I'll ask you to draw more circles for different cases. And then draw, I'll ask you to draw the slip lanes near the corrective, for example. I can ask them in the quiz. And this sigma two, the second point is sigma two. Complete the three dimensional more circles here. Circle one, circle two, and circle three, this is sigma two and this is zero. And time x. Occurs for a rotation about sigma two axis because, as you see, the rotation is in one three plane. Is sigma three zero, and if you draw draw the slip planes or maximum shear planes. We are trying to show maximum shear planes for plane stress. And I can consider a 3D element now. At the corrective, one direction, two direction. What are the maximum shear planes? It corresponds to a rotation about two axes, and therefore, and we know that these planes are oriented at an angle of 45 degrees from more circle analysis. And for this reason, these are these inclined planes are slip planes, they are referred to as slip planes for plane stress or maximum shear stress planes or the case of plane stress. And I can show it for plane strain as well. Thinner specimens or thinner specimens, this is, these are the slip planes or thicker ones or for plane strain. Again, we start with the same mode one crack. For an element slightly above the symmetric plane, I can depict the principal stresses as we have shown here. If that is a stress element, sigma one, sigma two. But there's also the third one or the third stress is sigma three. And you have to show, include sigma three in the more circle. So this is sigma, sigma one and sigma two. Yes, but sigma three now is in between. Our more circles are different for plane strain or thicker specimens. Sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. And um, the rotation for slip planes or maximum shear planes, 
has to be about which axis now? If you consider again an element at the crack front, stress element at the crack front. In the rotation for slip planes takes place about which axis? It is in sigma one, sigma two. Plane takes place about sigma three axis. Uh, shoulder inclined planes or maximum shear planes for this case. These are referred to as slip planes for plane strain. Uh, <clears throat> these are uh, illustrated in a figure. I'm going to show that figure. The figure shows variation of plastic zone size in an actual specimen at the outer part or close to the surface, plane stress con condition is dominant, close to the free surface, plastic zone size is larger in a specimen of finite width. And this is the plastic zone size is getting smaller as you, as the point moves into the specimen. In the two limiting cases, in plane stress, thin specimens, uh, thick specimens, we know that the plastic zone size is respectively smaller and larger, but if the thickness is in between, in general, there is such a transition from the plane stress shape to the plane strain shape, and that's the crack, this is the crack point. And these are the slip zones that I have mentioned. If you, we have carried out this calculation for plane stress for an elements located at the crack front. These are the maximum shear stress planes and they are referred to as slip planes near the crack front. The orientation of slip planes is different for the case of plane strain. Again, 45 degree planes, but they are they correspond to a rotation about the Z direction. That's possible to observe the variations for different types of specimens. This is for thinner specimens, this is for relatively thicker specimens. Uh, I've talked so, uh, about some of these results. K1C value is uh, generally used in fraction analysis because it's independent of thickness and can be considered as a real material property. And it's a lower bound value. But it will be conservative to use K1C band regardless of the thickness of the specimen, except for extremely thin specimens. And you can see the relative values for carbon steel and the yield strength. For alloy steel, it is a somewhat lower. These are high strength materials. And these results are for titanium alloys. They are shown by about 140 megapascals square for meters. Significantly lower for aluminum, for these aluminum alloys. If there is a small defect, 
it's in the material or a crack and you apply a certain force and you will end up with a lower force that uh, is required for fracturing the specimen. And these are all K1C values uh, for different types of metallic materials. And I have uh, mentioned some other material types, ceramics, plastics, or there are different standards for different types of engineering materials that should be followed to determine the K1C value. Now, thickness is not the only important parameter here. We can think about temperature effects as well as loading rate effect, but I'm going to talk about those uh, next time. Before I'm going to stop the recording now.